Starship 15 has been moved from the pad, but SpaceX has their sights set on something bigger. More Starlink satellites have been placed into orbit, but the competition is getting desperate. Cargo Dragon 2 heads to resupply the space station, and yet more missions are set for the very near future. And we finish with today's honorable mention. I'm Kevin, and this is SpaceX in the News. I know a lot of you have been asking why last week's episode went MIA, so stick around, I'm going to address that at the end of today's video. Last week, all three of SN15's Raptor engines were removed and the rocket was dismounted off suborbital launch pad B and transported back up Highway 4 to the construction site, where it currently resides as another decorative lawn ornament. The hope was that SpaceX would relaunch this first Starship to survive a 10-click flight, but obviously that no longer seems likely. It will either go the way of Starhopper and become a useful effigy, or it will follow in the footsteps of SN17, which was deconstructed this week. Like a heartless philanderer, Elon has already moved on and is focusing on his next big score, sharing a picture of SN16 and Booster 2, which is also known as BN3, just to alleviate the inevitable confusion that has caused. BN2 turned BN2.1 when it was converted into a test tank, which will be used to determine how well Super Heavy will hold up under a copious amount of simulated Raptor thrust using nine hydraulic rams. It was transported to the launch site on Thursday and road closures are scheduled for its stress tests as early as Monday. So BN3 became Booster 2 since it will be only the second fully stacked Super Heavy booster. And so naturally the question becomes, what's SpaceX gonna do with it? No longer does Elon have plans to do a twin engine hop. Multiple Super Heavy thrust pucks have been spotted on site at Starbase repping dozens of Raptor ports. The latest one arriving over the weekend, which contained nine mounting points. Another 20 engines will ring around the outside, which Elon confirmed brings the new tally up to 29 engines for the first stage, rising to 32 later this year. At which time, the center three Raptors and the inner ring of nine will gimbal, and the outer 20 secured to the hull will remain fixed, greatly improving the boost back burn efficiency. The hardest part about Starship is the tall stuff and small stuff, installing all the pipes and wires. The hard part about Raptor is simplifying it. So I guess in some circumstances, the KISS principle is kind of ironic. But his engineers are pumping out one Raptor engine every two days these days, which is great considering they're going to need plenty of them when they start flying a few dozen at a time. And all those engines will need to be tested. That happens in McGregor, Texas near Reagan's place. SpaceX teams there have added a new test stand that can fire up to two different engines, sea level or vacuum, in two different bays. She also just heard a Raptor performing an orbital duration static fire last week, longest one yet that lasted more than five minutes. Oh, and Elon twatted that they are aiming to have hot gas thrusters on the booster for the first orbital flight, which brings more efficiency to the table and something that needs to be done for in-situ refueling purposes on Mars. So back to our original question, what's next for Starship? Well, all we have is good old fashioned speculation. Naturally, we'd think SN16 would be next. Its mission may be to 20 clicks. I mean, it's built and it could be moved to the launch site today if Elon deemed it so. But yet here it sits in the high bay next to Booster 2. Is Elon sending us a cryptic message that these two will fly together, even though it was expected that SN20 would be the first to stack on Super Heavy? And since the first orbital mission over Hawaii isn't actually going to see Starship reach orbit, do Raptor Vax need apply? Vacuum fit testing was seen a couple weeks ago going on in Starbase, but with a separate test article. SpaceX was planning to launch a fully stacked Starship Super Heavy by July 1st, and now that SN15 was successful, have they decided to skip higher suborbital tests and just go big with the FCC plans they submitted a few weeks back? If that's the case, and if SN16 doesn't get its time to shine solo, then we won't be seeing another launch down there for another month or two. But only time will tell, unless Elon tells first. That's not to say nothing will be going on down in Starbase though, far from it. The FAA does have TFRs in place for the entire months of June and July, indicating an expectation of a plethora of ground tests. And SpaceX is still working on the orbital launch site, which will have to be completed prior to any super heavy liftoffs. Ground system equipment tanks and their insulation shells are still being constructed and moved to the launch site, as is the orbital launch and integration tower. And that thing's growing faster than the weeds in the lawyer wife's tomato garden as is the orbital launch mount that rests next to the tower. Lab's cameras captured the legs getting topped off with table supports, and RGV spotted crews attaching hold-down clamps inside the table that Super Heavy will rest upon. I don't know. It's almost as if... I get this weird feeling that Elon wants to skip any more foreplay and just penetrate Carmen. And let's not forget about his oil rigs turning ocean spaceports. Deimos will be hosting orbital Super Heavy launches next year, 
It's currently undergoing construction in South Texas, and its sister, Phobos, is doing the same off Mississippi. The U.S. military is also super excited about Starship and its point-to-point -point capabilities. They have already been studying concepts with SpaceX for rapid cargo transportation through space, but now are seeking to invest up to $48 million for their new rocket cargo program to fund prototypes and technologies needed for commercial vehicle use. A month or so ago, SpaceX won NASA's HLS contract to take Artemis astronauts to the surface of the moon, a decision that has since been contested by competitors like Blue Origin, arguing that the program needs an open architecture, deep experience, massive self-funded investments, and a safe, low-risk design to return to the moon. To which Elon responded, for the low, low price of, you know, because SpaceX outbid them with a lower price. But HLS isn't the only drama that's being flung at Elon's company lately. Viasat is of course still trying to get Starlink canceled. A few months back, they, along with other competitors, tried to prevent SpaceX from lowering the orbit of some of their Starlink satellites. But now they're asking the FCC to perform a review of Starlink's environmental impact. Of course, this is just a facade of Viasat's real beef with Starlink. In the very same FCC request, they stated that they will suffer competitive injury if Starlink is permitted to compete directly with Viasat in the market for satellite broadband services. Really? Competitive injury, you say? You mean you're a victim of the free market? Look, I know we're becoming an equity over equality socialist society the longer we're under this current regime, but how far has our capitalist society fallen when you have major corporations trying to pull this entitlement crap with the government? The free market is a jungle. It's beautiful and brutal and should be left alone. On Wednesday of last week, SpaceX gave the one finger salute to its competitors and launched yet another batch of Starlink satellites into Earth orbit in a cost saving fashion. Greg Scott was there to photograph the giant boomsticks ascent into the heavens. It marked the 100th consecutive successful launch of Falcon 9 and already their 16th one of the year. It was also the 40th time the company reflew Falcon fairing half since they began doing it in November of 2019. Oh, and the booster survived to launch another day too. And yet we do have another mission coming our way this weekend. Slated for early Sunday morning is the launch of a Sirius XM satellite at 12.25 a.m. Eastern. SpaceX has also filed with the FCC to fly six more Starlink missions out of Vandenberg Space Force Station beginning next month. One of those West Coast boosters was spotted heading that way last week by Reddit user Wig7. Someone please give Viasat a tissue, or maybe a tampon. Now for some Dragon news. Like a boss, SpaceX also launched another Falcon 9 rocket on Thursday this week, first new rocket of the year, to place a new Cargo Dragon 2 capsule on a trajectory to the ISS. CRS-22 is a resupply mission to carry new solar arrays for the Dragon's layer above. The first stage is also notable in that since it survived the landing on the drone ship, it will be used for missions Inspiration 4 and Crew 3 later this year. Training continues for the world's first private passenger crew, Inspiration 4. They're spending time in SpaceX's simulators so they can tame the Dragon. And on Wednesday, Axiom Space announced their partnership with SpaceX to launch private space station missions Axe 1 through 4, all on Crew Dragon capsules, further solidifying the beginnings of the age of space tourism we find ourselves in. And now it's time for today's honorable mention. <laughs> NASA has announced their next big project as part of their discovery program. By 2030, they will send two separate spacecraft to the solar system's second planet to study its atmosphere and geologic history. The Da Vinci probe's mission will be to enter the atmosphere of Venus to help us understand how it formed and whether or not oceans ever existed on it. And the Veritas satellite's mission will be to map the surface of Venus and study its terrain. Both missions will cost half a billion each. If you remember back to last year, it was believed that phosphine gas was discovered in the clouds of Venus, and clickbait fake news couldn't stress alien life enough in their headlines. A surprise, it all turned out to be a bunch of bull. Shocking. Of course, the Babylon Bee, a publisher of satire, and yet a news organization with more integrity than big media, got the last laugh. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. Thanks for tuning in. Shout out to my eccentric members and patrons for supporting the channel. Love you all a long time. If you'd like to feel some of this love, join the fam using the links in the description below. Do have a nominal weekend, and until next time, Godspeed. Hey guys, today's message is kind of a lengthy one, so once again, I made it its own separate video. I'll put the link in the description, as well as a little clickable box right here that you can tap away at, and maybe an annotation or two up in the corners if those are on. If you're on Rumble, I went ahead and made it its own video again so you can find that on the channel. I'll see you there.